So, Fred, if we can start um, in the 20s when you really began playing. Late 20s. In the. <laughs> I'm sorry. What um, sort of people were playing the game in those days? Well, what we used to call, uh, from, from my neck of the woods, the hoi polloi. It was, uh, it was a game uh, that the lower middle class really had never seen or played much, much of. I started out as a table tennis player in the, in the, in the early days. And uh, when I did get interested in tennis, I just transposed one to the other because uh, the strokes are the same, the, uh, the angles are the same, the spins are the same, and uh, it made it easier for me. I just carried one from one to the other. So that's how I got started. Was it difficult for you to break into a, a, a socially fairly tight knit little group? Well, it wasn't easy. I mean, the first time I ever saw the game played at all and really got interested is my family were down in Eastbourne uh, for, for a holiday. And uh, one morning I escaped, and uh, about the middle 20s, I guess this was, or early 20s, and wound up at Devonshire Park. Peeked through the fence, I couldn't afford to go in. And I saw these crazy people running around in white clothes and chasing this little white ball, and it looked very nice. And I watched it for a couple of hours, and. There were hundreds of these big, sleek cars, Daimlers and things, sitting outside. So my father said to me, where have you been? So when I got back at lunchtime, I told him what I'd been doing. And he said, what do you think? I said, well, all those big cars around the place, so they all belong to the tennis players. He said, yes. It's that kind of a game. Why? I said, well, if, if they play tennis and they get those kind of cars, that's for me. So he said, uh, I said, I like to, like to play it. He said, well, I've got a racket that I haven't used in a long time, you can have that, and that's how I started. What was your own background? Did you go to a public school? No, no, I, I was educated, uh, then we moved to Bolton. I was born in, in Stockport, and then we moved to, to uh, Wallasey, on the other side of the Mersey from Liverpool, and I went to Wallasey Grammar School. And then in 1918, we came down to London, lived in Ealing, and I went to Ealing County. You eventually did break in, purely and simply because you were the best one round. Once you broke in... I think that was probably the reason I broke in, I don't know. Were you resented? Well, I don't think I was resented. Uh, they were very surprised, I think, to think that someone without the right tie, or, 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 or part of the right tie, could, uh, could do it. Uh, but I was a strange breed of cat, because I was a loner. And uh, if I may use such a word on, uh, on television over here, I was bloody-minded about the whole thing. I had won the, the uh, I won the table tennis championship of the world in 1929 in Budapest, and never played again. I said, right, from now on, nothing I, I, I do will interfere with my tennis. Uh, I played soccer at school and I played cricket. I was a less than, even worse than bad wicketkeeper, uh, and uh, the ball was too hard for me. So when I started to play tennis, I, I'd fiddled around at it in Ealing. And um, I got into Wimbledon, actually, uh, in 1929. I qualified at Roehampton in 1929. I think I played three or four five-set matches to qualify. And on the first day, I beat uh, a fellow called Bocciado from Italy in five sets uh, on a court uh, way out. And the next day, I think I, I got one court higher, and I beat a fellow called Captain Dick, who was an Englishman. We beat him in five sets. Can I interrupt you there? Mm. Tell me, if you would, the story when you won the final and against Jack Crawford and the reaction on the story afterwards in the dressing room. Well, there were a lot of things happened between, between when I started and then. I mean, the first one was when uh, old Pop Summers, uh, who's, who's uh, long since passed on, was, was my mentor. And uh, he said one day, you're going to play the, uh, the schoolboy tournament at Queen's Club. I said, well, it's the public school tournament. He said, no, it isn't. It's the schoolboys tournament. So I entered, he entered me in that, and I went up to Queen's Club with my bag, and they said, oh, good morning, sir, uh, what school? Oh, I said, Ealing. And they said, Ealing? I said, yes. They said, oh, we have no, uh, no locker for you for Ealing. I said, oh, you've got one now. Uh, I didn't do very well in any, in any junior tournaments. I wasn't that good, and, uh, and I was still learning. Uh, the big crunch came, I think, when uh, I had, uh, got fairly good and Pop Summers said, right, I think you can, with your particular game, you can be uh, the best player in England eventually, but if you want to be the best player in the world, you're going to have to learn to take the ball early. 
take the ball on the rise. Uh, and I said, when do we start? And he said, tomorrow morning. And for six months, uh, I never hit my head. I broke windows uh, almost two streets away. We did all this at the Herger Club in Harrow and, uh, and Chiswick Park in, in London. And the members were very kind. They, they, they came out day after day and gave a half an hour or an hour of their time just hitting the ball where it had to be hit for me to learn what I wanted to learn. Now, do you think that determination to get to the top was because you didn't come from the public school background? Well, I don't know. I, was, I would probably have been the same had I been to a public school. Uh, as I say, I was, I was quite bloody-minded about the whole thing. I was a loner. I wanted to do it my way because it suited me, and I was happy playing that way, and I'm quite convinced that this game, that's why you have so many varying styles. Unless you're happy hitting the ball the way you hit it, and you're comfortable that way and enjoy it, uh, then it becomes a chore. Can you so, tell me that story again, the one after you'd won Wimbledon against oh yeah. Crawford? Well, uh, he's presented with a tie, which is a great honor. I mean, this is the tie, see? I think this is the same one, as a matter of fact. And uh, then you, and uh, I always used to, to close myself up with Pop Summers uh, in, 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 in the, uh, the bathroom and for about 30 minutes and just soak afterwards. Uh, to collect your thoughts and things, and uh, so you won't say the wrong thing, although I always did anyway. Uh, and uh, I came out and the tie was draped over the back. Uh, naturally, I popped off about it, I resented it. And in fact, uh, for we were still in the Davis Cup, I mean, we, we held the Davis Cup then, we won it in 1933, and there was quite a hassle as to whether I was going to play in the challenge round or not. Now, it was a bit earlier than that, in fact, going back to the 20s, when uh, tennis ceased to be a purely social game and professionals entered the game. Could you tell me about the early days of professionals? See, the real first pro tour was a result of a bet. There was a fellow in America called Cash and Carry Pyle who had much more money than cents. And uh, he thought that these promoters, he was sitting with a bunch of promoters uh, one night, and he said, that, oh, I can run a tennis tour and make money. And he said, don't be silly, tennis is a, not that kind of a game, you can't run a professional tour, because all pros were just teachers. And uh, the line was very, very, very well drawn. And uh, he said, right. So he got, uh, he got uh, Suzanne Longlong, uh, and he paid her $25,000, which was an astronomical sum in those days. He got Mary Kay Brown from California to, to play against her. He had to have somebody for her to play. He got Vincent Richards, uh, the American, to, uh, who'd won the last Olympic Games, as a matter of fact, in, in Amsterdam, about 1924, I think it was. And uh, he got the Kinsey brothers. And they toured, and they made money, believe it or not. That was the first one. Then they toured again. Uh, and then a fellow called uh, Eugene Dixon came in, uh, who was a... Uh, uh, he was a promoter, boxing promoter, for a couple of years. Then Tilden came in, and it was all with the format was very simple. It was it was a one night stand, head to head. He played for about four and a half months in the United States in the winter, anywhere that had a roof over it. You played now, basketball courts and things. Now, just to interrupt again for a moment, yeah. were the like that on the um, so w w you've been talking oh, about yeah. the first professional. Right. I was just about to say, in fact. Um, was there any difference between the ways the uh, between the ways the amateurs and the professionals were treated? Oh, definitely. I mean, well, I mean, let, 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 I think you must understand how it happened. You see, it was a head to head. Now, the the, the reigning professional champion uh, played the incoming amateur, who was usually the Wimbledon champion or the number one in the world. Uh, after Tilden, then uh, Cochet came in. Uh, after Cochet, Tilden played Vines. And then after Vines had been in a couple of years, I came in and we played in Madison Square Garden in January the 6th, 7th, 1940, uh, 1937, to a gate of uh, 17,800 people. And the gate was over $50,000, which was a lot of money in those days. And that was the record crowd that had ever seen any professional tennis match indoors up till Billie Jean King played Bobby Riggs somewhere out in the desert in, in, uh, in uh, in uh, Houston. What I was getting at there, that in the clubhouse, for instance, was there any demarcation? Were there separate changing rooms for amateurs and professionals? Well, the professionals didn't play tournaments. 
There was the, there was the professional tournament of Great Britain, which was usually played at Eastbourne, a, a small monetary thing, maybe of 50 or 100 pounds for the winner. But that was something completely separate. That was just maybe one. Uh, professional tournaments as such were very, very few and very far between. They were mostly started by Tilden, Richards and myself after the war. That was the original start of it.